Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this professional development opportunity. My name is Joe Schmidt. I'm the Social Studies Specialist for the Maine Department of Education. Today, we are beyond lucky, and I am beyond thrilled to introduce uh, Dr. Diana Hess, the current Dean of Education at the University of Wisconsin. And before anybody says anything and says, Joe, you just invited her because she's from Wisconsin and you're from Wisconsin, um, that might be true. But I'm also introducing her because in previous sessions we've talked and I've referenced her books. She is the co-author of The Political Classroom and the author of Controversy in the Classroom and has done decades of research related to uh, the conversations that we have in classrooms, practices, uh, what the research says, how to engage in those topics and so on and so forth. Because I had referenced the book so many times, people had said, can we just have Dr. Hess join us? And I reached out to her and she was happy to join us. We had a quick change of the calendar, but she is here with us today. Um, and before I turn it over to her, I'm glad to see so many people are here because I hope the, the listserv emails stressed um, the unique opportunity that we have here. Uh, Dr. Diana Hess is the type of speaker and presenter that my national organizations bring in to speak to me. So we are very, very privileged and blessed to have her. Um, and I think I nailed all the big talking points for you. Dean of the Education System at University of Wisconsin, uh, author of a couple books, uh, NCSS 2017 Researcher of the Year. Um, and without further ado, I don't know if, how many more amazing things I can say. I will turn it over to Dr. Diana Hess. Well, thank you so much. I am honored to talk with all of you today. And I really wanna um, thank you, Joe, for the opportunity and for that very nice introduction. So today I'm going to talk about five questions related to controversial political issues. And throughout my discussion, I will have several points at which I ask you to do some thinking and then some sharing. But let me begin by saying that the five questions that I'm going to work with you on today, begin with this one. What is the relationship between controversial topics, problems, and issues? The second question is what are controversial political issues? The third question is what is the difference between an open and a settled issue, an empirical and a policy issue? The fourth one is why should we include controversial political issues in the school curriculum? And finally, the fifth question is what are key best practices about teaching young people to engage in discussions or deliberations of controversial political issues? So my lesson plan is to spend a brief amount of time talking about each of the questions and then I've got something that I want you to do related to each of the questions. And then when we have about 20 minutes or so left, I'm just going to open it up to any questions or comments that any of you have. So I hope that sounds like a workable plan. So let's then begin with the first question, which is what is the relationship between controversial topics, problems, and issues? And what I found in my own work and I was a high school teacher for many years, so I experienced this uh, with my colleagues and in lots of venues in which I've worked since, is that sometimes when we talk about topics and problems and issues, we use them interchangeably. And I think doing that is a challenge. And I think doing that is, for the most part, not a good idea because it tends to suppress the controversy that's inherent in issues. And the main point that I'm gonna be making throughout our time together today is it's really important for a variety of reasons to include controversial political issues in the curriculum. So a topic to begin is uh, something that can be defined or described in a variety of ways. A topic could be a place, it could be an event, it could be an act, it could be a process. And we often, when we're talking about what we're going to teach, we start by talking about the topic. So we might say, well, I'm starting the unit on immigration today, or today we're going to have a debate about healthcare. So that would be an example of two topics, healthcare and immigration. So what I'd like to start with is to have you think about some 
topics that you currently teach in one of your classes that you think are important. And I'm gonna make it even more challenging than that. If there's a topic that is contemporary, why don't we hone in on that one? So just take a moment and think about a topic that you currently teach in one of your classes. And ideally, the topic is contemporary. And what I'd like you to do is just in the chat, list uh, what that topic is. And if you wanna give a few, that's fine as well. So as we all watch the chat, we'll be seeing all these topics come in. So again, a topic could be an event, it could be a person, it could be a place, it could be an act, it could be a belief. So why don't you go ahead and put in the topics that come to mind. Here's what I'm noticing. A is that they're all clearly topics that they, for the most part, are contemporary and they really look interesting to me. It makes me wanna be in your classes. I mean, these are the kinds of topics that look both interesting and important. So I think if you, you know, take a look at the chat with me, you can see that the topics range from the election to uh, different types of government, to um, slavery, civil rights, treatment of indigenous peoples past and present. So we've got a broad array of different kinds of topics here. So let's go to the second thing, which is, well, what's the relationship between a topic and a problem. So oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes we will have a topic, let's take for example, immigration as a topic. And related to immigration, there are some problems that are presenting themselves either contemporarily or historically. So an example would be, um, do, um, let's see, let's think of a problem related to immigration. Um, the impact of um, separated families and, and the kinds of problems that that pre presents um, could be a problem related to immigration. Another problem related to immigration could be that there are um, uh, disputes about whether or not people should be privileged um, as to come into the United States or another nation um, because of something intrinsic to their background or whether or not that should be something about an experience they've had. So for example, big debates, not just in the United States, but in other countries about whether or not people who have um, some special skills skills that are really needed in the country should get privileged over other people who desire to emigrate into the country. So what I'd like you to do for just a moment, this is going to be hard, is take just one of your topics and think about a problem related to that topic. So for example, a lot of you have elections as a topic. And one problem related to elections in the United States clearly is that often in elections, voter participation is low. So what I'd like you to do now is just try to identify perhaps in a phrase or a sentence, a problem related to one of the topics you've identified. I'm noticing is that these are clearly all problems. They're related to the topics that you had identified. And there are a lot of very different types of problems that are coming up here. As these are coming through, let me give you just one other example to kind of solidify the relationship between a topic and a problem. So a topic that is certainly important now is healthcare. A problem related to healthcare is unequal access to high quality healthcare. So you can imagine somebody saying, so I want to focus on healthcare and the problem related to it that I would like to focus on is unequal access to high quality healthcare.
All right, thank you so much for um, identifying these and for entering them into the chat. Let's go to the third thing, because remember the question we're working on is what is the relationship between controversial topics, problems, and issues? So we've done topics and problems, and now let's go to issues. And to be more specific, I want to talk about a specific kind of issue, which is what I call a controversial political issue. And a controversial political issue is an issue that raises a question of what we should do to address or solve a particular problem. What makes it political or a policy issue is that this is something that is a matter of public policy. In other words, a we would need to decide through some kind of process. And the, uh, the issue, the controversial political issue is tightly connected to both a topic and a problem. So to use my example for a moment, if the topic is healthcare and the problem is unequal access to healthcare, then one controversial political issue related to that is should our state expand access to publicly paid for healthcare? Now notice with respect to that question that that's contemporary. It's a matter of public policy meaning that it needs to have some kind of policy making in order to have a decision, that the way the question is framed presumes that it's a matter of legitimate controversy, that there are multiple and competing views, that it's not a question for which there is one clear right answer that there is broad-based agreement on that it is literally a question of controversy. So what I'd like you to do now, and this is the, the hardest part of this um, three-part exercise, is to frame your problem as an issue. So again, to go back to my example, healthcare, unequal access to healthcare. And you can imagine related to that problem, there could be a whole array of controversial political issues. The one that I put on the table is, should our state provide increased access to publicly paid health care? So that would be one issue related to the problem. It's not the only issue related to the problem. You can imagine many more. So given the topic and the problem that you're working on, see if you can frame it as an issue. Now, some of you are dealing with um, topics and problems that are clearly historical, in which case you would frame the issue as a controversial political issue of that time. Most of you have identified issues that are, or problems and topics that are contemporary. So take, um, just a couple minutes and start identifying a controversial political issue related to your problem. So here's one I see, who should decide how voting districts are drawn? Should wealthier nations pay more to protect the environment and help poor countries develop in an environmentally friendly manner? Should immigrants be able to vote? Should Maine tribes have a seat in the Maine legislature with full voting rights? Should everyone be able to vote by mail in the 2020 election? Should the United States adopt the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? So what I'm noticing about the issues that you are identifying um, is kind of threefold. One is almost all of them are framed 
as a should. And in my experience, should questions are really excellent ways of framing controversial political issues. Because in a nutshell, that's really what we're working on. We're working on the problem, the larger problem, as Paula McAvoy and I talk about in the political classroom, of how should we live together? That's kind of the, the big should question. And all of these issues that you're identifying are matters of policy, deliberation, and debate about what should we do. So that's the first thing that I'm noticing. The second thing I'm noticing is that many, I would say probably most, are fairly specific. So here's one, here's an example. Should our state provide more voting stations? That's a very specific controversial political issue. Now, as a general rule of thumb, the more specific you frame a controversial political issue for the curriculum, the better your discussion about that issue is going to be because people know what they're honing in on. So a question like, what should we do about unequal access to health care tends not to be a very good question for discussion because it's simply too broad. And topics that are better for discussion tend to be more specific. So that's the second thing I'm noticing. So first is should. Second is that they're pretty specific for the most part. And third is that just as I'm looking at them, they seem incredibly important to me. That these are issues that it would be hard for somebody to say, hmm, that's trivial. That's something that people don't care about. That's something that's not really important to focus on. So what I'm seeing is that it wasn't really very hard for you to come up with a way to frame a controversial political issue that meets um, the criteria for what constitutes a well-framed issue for the curriculum. So that just reinforces what Joe has told me a lot, which is that Maine teachers rock, because this is a hard thing to do. It's hard to learn how to frame issues. So this first question, what is the relationship between controversial topics, problems, and issues, I think you've illustrated well by first identifying a topic, a problem related to it, and now a specific issue related to that problem. So we've also then addressed what was the second question, which is what is a controversial political issue? Let's stay on that question for a little bit because I wanna talk more about what makes a good controversial political issue for the curriculum as a general rule of thumb. So people will often say to me, look, there's a wide array of important controversial political issues that could be included in my course. And how should I decide among that wide array? And as a general rule, I have three answers to that question, but I'm gonna ask for your answers in a moment too. So be thinking about that. Put another way, what are the criteria that we should use to decide which controversial political issues are really good to include in our course. So the first one I have is what I call a content win. That as a general rule of thumb, I think controversial political issues that are really good for the curriculum and really good to have students learn about are issues that in the process of learning about that issue, students are gonna be learning a lot of content that you think is really important for students to learn. Now, it's the case that it would be impossible to learn about a controversial political issue without learning some content. But what I'm suggesting here is that for every course you teach, you have a sense of what are the things that I really want to make sure students learn, and I want them to learn them in a deep way. And one way to do that is to make sure that that learning takes part, at least in part, by talking about controversial political issues. So that's number one. Number two is that 
the controversial political issues that are best for the curriculum are all things being equal, important issues, important in a variety of ways. One way I judge important, and Joe, I wanna check on a minute. It, it looks like I've lost you. Can you hear me? Yep, I'm good. Okay, great. I just turned my video off to not be a distraction. Okay, um, I just saw your name and I thought, oh no, where did Joe go? Um, so content win was number one. Number two is the, the controversial political issue is an important one. And obviously there's all sorts of ways we can define what important means. One way is that the controversial issue would affect many people. So here I'm looking at one, should voting be required uh, from Nicole? This actually is one of my favorite issues. I've been teaching about this issue for years and years and years. And when I first started teaching about it, it seemed so incredibly hypothetical, even though a number of nations in the world require voting, um, many, most, do not. And so, you know, 15 years ago when I first started teaching about this issue and I started watching national curriculum groups like Street Law and the Constitutional Rights Foundation develop curriculum about this issue, it seemed fairly hypothetical, um, at least hypothetical to the United States. Now, as you might be noticing, is that this issue is, be, is becoming a little bit more live. We've had major political figures in the last couple of years advocate having a real authentic discussion about whether or not requiring people to vote in the United States would be a good idea. So content win and that it's important. Then the third criteria that I rely on is are there high quality curriculum materials already in existence? Or for me as the teacher, would it be not too burdensome to develop high quality curriculum materials? So one of the things that I often do when I'm considering a plethora of potential controversial political issues for courses that I teach is I will look far and wide to try to identify what are the existing high quality curriculum materials. Because one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit later is the importance of making sure that students are well prepared to talk about controversial political issues. It's extremely hard to do that unless there are high quality curriculum materials. So those are three criteria that I use. Is there a content win? Is it important? Are there high quality curriculum materials? Or can I develop them without too much of a burden? So what I'd like you to do now is uh, add other criteria that you use or that you would advocate your colleagues use when they're trying to decide which controversial political issues to include in the curriculum. And if you are used one of the three that I mentioned and you want to, to say that you use that, that's fine. But my sense is that you probably have some other criteria that you use as well, because I'm not suggesting that my three are as many as you need to have. It's just those are the three that I tend to start with. So what are some of the criteria that you use? Okay, again, I'm noticing that it doesn't seem at all difficult for you to come up with criteria that really make a lot of sense. I mean, many of you are saying 
that you're interested in whether or not it's relevant and you're defining relevant in different ways. Some of you are saying, is it relevant to my students that I'm currently teaching? Others are, of you are saying, is it relevant to the community that I'm living in and my students are living in? Sometimes relevance is called authenticity, where people will argue that the best controversial political issues are those that are authentic to the actual political world, meaning that the livelier they are, the more that they're in play now, um, the better they are, because it's easier for people to connect to something that's actually happening compared to something that's a hypothetical. Many of you are talking about um, kind of developmental appropriateness for your students, whether or not your students can, can handle the issue. A number of you are talking about uh, the background that your students already have and the extent to which students have enough background knowledge to be able to learn about the issue. In addition to this question of a content win, um, I'm seeing Jessica here has, will the topic develop skills and practices that will prepare them to become involved citizens? So that's kind of a skill win, right? Like some issues may be better at helping students to, vet, to develop particular skills than others. So here would be an example of that. If one of the reasons we teach about controversial issues is we want students to learn how to deal appropriately and civically, civilly with um, differences of opinion. So we want people to learn not only how to advocate their own opinion, or it may be that they come into the discussion not having a, a prior opinion on the issue, but we want young people to develop the ability to talk with people who have different views than they have. And that's, I would argue, that's really, it's a, both a disposition and it's a skill, that some people are more skillful at dealing with difference than other people. And it may be that there are some controversial political issues that you could put in your curriculum and you could pretty easily predict based on knowing your students that there wouldn't be that much naturally occurring difference of opinion about them and so issues for which there's not naturally occurring differences of opinion in your class are probably not the best issues to help your students get practice at the skills that they're going to need to deal with, to learn how to, to deal with um, people who have differences of opinion. So, I'm just seeing a, a, a wonderful list here of a lot of, of really important criteria. And I'd like you to do one final thing before we move on to the next question, which is to go back to the issue that you had shared with us just a few minutes ago. And identify what criteria that issue meets. So for example, if you said that it was important that an issue be timely, uh, like Melanie has said, or you have said it's important to make sure that the issue develops um, skills, like Jessica has said, interrogate your own issue to see the extent to which it meets um, that criterion. need to add anything at this point in the chat to that, but I just want to kind of help you get a sense of, you know, what it looks like to have a variety of controversial political issues to potentially include in your curriculum and to have some meaningful and high quality way to determine which issues should come into the curriculum. And to do that, I think it's really important to be very both specific and transparent about the criteria you're using. So if a student asks you, if a parent asks you, if a principal asks you, why are you including that 
issue in the curriculum, you can explain that you're including that issue in the curriculum because it meets these criteria. And I just think in general, we tend to make better curricular decisions if we're pretty clear on the front end about how we're gonna make decisions about what to include in the curriculum and what not to include in the curriculum. Because obviously, we can't include all the issues that we might want to include. So we've dealt with two questions broadly here. What is the relationship between controversial topics, problems, and issues? What are controversial political issues? And we've talked about the important question of criteria. I wanna talk for just a few moments about the third question, which is what is the difference between an open and a settled issue, an empirical and a policy issue? So my definition of controversial political issues is that by definition, they need to be open. And by open, what I mean is that they are a live controversy, or if we're dealing historically at one point, they were a live controversy. And there are legitimate multiple possible right answers to the question. Doesn't mean that people haven't made a decision about what they think the best answer is. But that in the world of public policy, there is still a live controversy. And this is very, very difficult because what constitutes an open question changes over time. So let me contrast an open question. Like I would argue uh, now that all the, many of, well, actually, I think kind of without exception, I didn't see any issues come up. Now, one of them might have that I missed that strikes me as not open. So I think that you know, these are authentic questions of public policy. There are multiple and competing views. A settled question, on the other hand, is one for which there is broad-based agreement that a particular decision is warranted um, and deserves support. Now, that often rings weird to people the first time they hear it because they think about, you know, doesn't the word issue by definition mean that it's open? And so if you have something that's called settled and an issue, it sounds like by definition it must be an oxymoron. But what I'm suggesting is that there are some questions of public policy that at one time were open that now are more settled. Doesn't mean that there's not some disagreement but that there's broad-based agreement that the answer, that a particular answer is the best one, is warranted. So for example, should women have the right to vote in the United States? Many of you are history teachers. At one time, that was absolutely an open issue. At one time, historically, it was also a settled issue where there was broad-based agreement that the best answer was no. And then it opened up, it was a live controversy, should women in the United States have the right to vote? And now I think there is very broad-based consensus on the fact that women should have the right to vote in the United States, that that's no longer a matter of live controversy. So what's the challenge here with the difference between an open question and a settled question? Well, I think the biggest challenge is what do you do when you're in kind of the middle of a transition where an issue is moving from being open to settled or an issue is moving from being settled to open. And I think teachers are often in kind of the, the early arbiters where they're expected to make a decision about, do I present this as a controversial political issue one for which we want a best case fair hearing of multiple points of view, or do I present this as a question for which there is a right answer that I want students to build and believe? So let me give you an example from my own teaching. When I started teaching in 1979, so obviously that was a very long time ago, I was teaching um, social studies in a very large high school that was outside of Chicago. The school at the time had almost, I think, 4,000 students. 
And it had an excellent curriculum that was really based around issue. And one of the topics that we um, studied in the required US history course was the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. And at that time in 1979, the question of whether or not the US government was justified in interning Japanese Americans during World War II was taught as an open question. If you were to go to textbooks from 1979, to educational films about the internment from that time, you would see it was very common to present that as an open question. And I remember after a couple of years teaching US history, saying to one of my colleagues that I was extremely uncomfortable with how we were teaching about the internment of Japanese Americans, because it seemed apparent to me that society was tipping from considering that an open question to considering that a more settled question, that we were entering the time where the US government issued an official apology, there was reparations paid, et cetera. And when I said this to my colleague who had taught for many, many years, he said, you know, it's interesting because when he started teaching, the question of whether or not it was justified to intern Japanese uh, Americans during World War II was taught as a settled question. And the answer was, yes, it was. And so during his time as a teacher, that question had opened. And now I was advocating, as were many people across the country, that that um, should be taught as a human rights violation and that that question should not be taught as a question that contemporaneously was an open question. And I don't know how that is taught in Maine, but as I go around the country and talk to teachers and look at curriculum materials, it seems to me that almost all the teaching about the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II presents it as a settled question, that the, the, the desire is not to have um, people actively debating or deliberating whether that was a good or a bad thing, but to have people see that as a, a human rights violation and, and something for which the, the nation should atone. And so I just use that story as an example of what happens when issues are tipping and the challenges that that often um, raises for teachers. And so one of the questions I have for you now, and this is a really hard question, is are there issues, whether or not you're currently teaching them in the curriculum, but are there controversial political issues that you think are tipping or that in your lifetime have tipped from either being settled to open or open to settled? Or it may be that you've got examples like I have where it was settled, you heard about it being settled to open to then settled. So I'm interested in just seeing those issues. that I imagine that there is disagreement among you about whether or not the examples that are being given as examples of issues that are, are in the tip, so to speak, in fact are. And that is kind of the nature of this challenge. What I advocate with Paula McAvoy in the political classroom is that it's really important for teachers to deliberate with one another whether or not uh, an issue should be presented as open or settled. That my experience has been that making that decision individually without the benefit of professional deliberation um, causes my decisions to be thinner than they would be otherwise. And of course, in order to do that, you're going to have to have some criteria for deciding, well, what makes an issue open and what makes an issue closed. And I think one of the things that is really difficult about teaching social studies now compared to 30 years ago or 40 years ago is that I think there are a lot of issues that are in the tip now. So I think teachers are really having to engage in this analysis, um, quite frankly, a lot more than what 
teachers needed to do 20 or 30 years ago. Now, I may be empirically wrong about that. That's just my sense as I've kind of watched the field over these many decades of being in it. So to come uh, to, uh, to a conclusion on that, let me just say that the thing that I most recommend is that you as an individual teacher don't make this decision on your own. And that I also would really pay a lot of attention to what high quality curriculum providers and developers are doing with respect to how that issue is being presented. So that's question three. So now let's go quickly to question four, which is why should the school curriculum include controversial political issues? And I'm gonna give you just three um, reasons that I think are really important. I probably could come up with about 15, and then I wanna see what some of your reasons are. So one reason is that living in a democracy means by definition that we as people need to make decisions about controversial political issues. Some of those decisions we need to make directly because we're asked to vote on, for example, a referendum. Some of those decisions we make indirectly. We elect people to legislatures of various sorts in order to uh, deliberate and make decisions about those issues. But by definition, democracy and deliberation and controversy all go together. And if the purpose of public education, and I would argue this is the purpose of private education as well, is in part to prepare young people to take their place on the democratic stage. And I don't mean that they do that when they're older. I think young people need to take their place on the democratic stage at a very young age. But in order to make sure that people can do that wisely and well, they need lots of practice learning how to learn about and how to make decisions about controversial political issues. So that's my first reason. My second reason is that controversial political issues, if they're taught in a way that's high quality, have some really important ancillary effects that have been well documented in the research. So when people say, well, what do we know about the kinds of civic education that really makes a difference in terms of students actually participating politically and civically, one of the things that we have a good understanding of from the literature is that when students have experiences learning about controversial political issues in schools in ways that are high quality, that's going to have a positive effect on their ability to participate politically and civically. So that's a second reason. And a third reason is that I think the ability to talk with people about things where there's deep and important disagreement is something that's not only important to have as somebody who's going to be taking the political stage, but is important to have more broadly in all aspects of our life. I think, you know, we know that we're living in a time that's incredibly polarized. And, you know, I think we are more deeply polarized than we've been in 100 years in the United States. And I think it's really important during a time of high political polarization for schools to do whatever they can do to help young people learn how to engage with difference, which doesn't mean that we want young people to have a particular viewpoint. It means that what we want is young people to be able to deliberate with others um, with whom they disagree. So those are three reasons that I often cite to explain why I think it's important for schools to talk about controversial political issues. So let's just take a moment and why don't you add some others? Because I know many of you are having your students talk about controversial political issues as evidenced by the fact that you have been able to come up with all these issues that you already are teaching about in your courses. So what are some other reasons that you think it's important to include such issues? So from Amy, I love this, teaches kids to think, to give reasons for their opinions, and to see other points of view.
to help students learn how to make an informed decision. It gives voice. So there's a whole lot of really great reasons that are being identified here. And so what I want to suggest to you is that um, I don't think it's difficult to come up with a rationale for including controversial political issues in the curriculum. So let me end with, I'm not going to end with this. I'll talk for just a few more minutes and then I'll answer any questions that you have. My fifth question is what are key best practices about teaching young people to engage in controversial political issues discussions? So if we think that this is an important thing to do, what does it look like to do it well? And in the two books that Joe mentioned, Controversy in the Classroom and the Political Classroom, there are a lot of case studies of teachers who are teaching about controversial political issues in ways that are, I think, high quality and research has shown have a long-term impact on their students. So what are some of the best practices? The first one is to make sure that students are well prepared, that it is highly unusual, almost unheard of, for students to come in cold and have a discussion of a controversial political issue in a way that's high quality. That's just not how this works. And so what we know from lots and lots of research and from watching teachers who are really good at this is that preparation is really important. Preparation leads to broader based participation and preparation leads to more learning. So that's one thing that I think stands out more than anything. The second thing is that as you learned when you, um, some of you were in Paula McAvoy's session, and if you weren't in that session, I suggest, really recommend that you go back and look at it. There's lots of models for how to engage students in controversial political issues discussions that work really well. Paula talked about one called Structured Academic Controversy, which is a small group discussion model that we have reams of research behind that really teaches students how to think about and talk about um, controversial political issues in high quality ways. So I think it's really important to have, you know, specific models for discussion that your students learn and that you think um, and that we know uh, work well. And then finally, last but not least, I want to come back to high quality curriculum materials. That it's really important for curriculum materials to be, you know, well prepared, well researched, we want to make sure that curriculum materials are accessible to students. We want to make sure that curriculum materials are one of the keys to preparation. So what I have seen kind of across the nation is that it's more likely that there's going to be high quality discussion of controversial political issues in the classroom if there are high quality curriculum materials that are being used. And thankfully, and Joe, I know has a lot of these resources and has made them available to you. We have a lot of organizations in the United States that their business is to produce high quality uh, materials on controversial political issues. And I think it's really important to take advantage of those as much as you can. So let me end there. I wanna thank you so much for your participation. I don't have a hard stop at 12, but I, I have kind of a hard stop at I would say 12.10. Joe, if that's okay with you. So what I'd like to do now is to open it up to questions or comments. So if any of you have a question that you would like me to address, either unmute yourself and introduce yourself and ask the question, which would be fine, or if you would prefer to put it in the chat, that's okay as well. So let's start with any questions that you have. And everybody does have the ability to unmute yourself at this time. Otherwise, um, I will be keeping an eye on the chat box. If Dr. Hess does not see your question, I can help with that as well. I know you're super impressed, but you got to have some questions. I saw some earlier in the chat box. So here's a question. Any online resources that you recommend? So um, I will make sure that um, I get a list of resources to Joe that he can make available to you. But here, let me just off the top tell you some that I think are really pretty good. There's um, 
uh, something called Procon.org. This is an organization that develops um, resources. They're not necessarily curriculum materials, but they often can be used as curriculum materials on contemporary political issues. And I just was informed this week that Procon.org, which is a free resource, has been bought by the Encyclopedia Britannica, which is, I think, fascinating. And they have pledged that they're gonna continue to make it free. Um, a second organization that I pay a lot of attention to is Street Law. So Street Law has high quality curriculum materials on controversial political issues and also on controversial constitutional issues. And so I would, I would, take a, a careful look at street law. A third organization is the Constitutional Rights Foundation. A fourth organization is the Mikva Challenge, which is now a national organization, but has developed some very high quality curriculum materials. A fifth organization is not far from you, is Choices um, for the 21st Century, which is a curriculum outfit that is based um, at Brown University, and they develop excellent curriculum materials. There are a lot of others as well, but those are some examples of, of organizations that routinely develop high quality um, curriculum materials. So here's a question. How do you handle discussion in which students express ideology shared at home that may be racist, et cetera? I think that's an incredibly important and timely question. Um, and I, I think that it's really important to develop classroom norms from the beginning about what um, language is allowed in the class and what language is not. And people often see this as they think it's kind of contradictory. They think like a controversial issues discussion should be some kind of free for all. And anybody can say anything they want in any way they want. And that's in fact not what we see teachers do in high quality controversial issues discussions. In fact, we see teachers working really hard to teach kids the skills of civic discourse. So there are just some things that are totally out of bounds. That there, there are, you know, it's extremely important to make sure that, you know, people are, are treated with respect. That being said, we all know that it's possible to express viewpoints that are racist viewpoints, that are homophobic viewpoints, that are problematic in so many ways, in ways that are civil. And so I think the real challenge for all of us, and certainly now more than ever, is to think really, really carefully about, again, what are open issues and what are settled issues. And to make sure that the balance in the classroom between on the one hand, having authentic controversy, and on the other hand, making sure the classroom is a place where all students feel included and respected, that this is a balance that um, is challenging, but not impossible. One of the things that I uh, learned from the research, both for the controversy in the classroom and the political classroom, and in that book, Paul and I have a whole chapter about how to deal with this, is that teachers are continually working on that. And that it is not, um, uh, a problem that is easily solved. Other questions I, for Dr. Hess? So I, here I see a comment that I think is really interesting. Maine has the challenges faced by its limited population diversity. And, you know, I um, think it's absolutely the case that the more homogenous an environment is, the more challenging it is to help people understand differing points of view. That being said, one of the things that causes me to think that it's really important to have controversial political issues discussions in classrooms is that schools, even though they clearly reflect the community in which they are housed, oftentimes will have more diversity than students encounter in other places where they might be having discussions of controversial political issues. So that I can guarantee you there's more diversity in all of your classes than there is in most families. 
think about the kinds of diversity that you have in your classes. You've got diversity based on socioeconomic status. You've got diversity based on religious differences. You've got diversity based on ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So even though there are some classes that are more um, homogenous and some classes that are more heterogeneous, I think it is the case that the one of the great strengths of schools is that they still tend to be um, the most diverse place um, in which young people um, hang out, experience, and are there a lot. So we've got Susan saying, I find the diversity is more subtle, but it is very strong. So when I do research on controversial political issues and I'm in classrooms, I often will ask a teacher to describe what are the dimensions of diversity in this classroom that um, have the most educational salience? And by that, I mean that the dimensions of diversity are a deliberative asset, that the dimensions of diversity are not a problem that needs to be solved, but in fact, they're an asset that needs to be leveraged. And I'm always um, so interested in what their answers are. There are times when I'll go into classes and I'll look and the students all look to be so similar to me. And then I listen to the teacher talk about those students and it's clear that there are lots and lots of differences. Dr. Hess, I wanna highlight a question that was in the chat box a while ago that I think is a good one. And then I'll ask you two. So I have two questions for you and I'll give them both ahead of time so you can determine your time schedule here. Um, Phil had asked earlier in regards to your criteria, how do we make sure that we're approaching the criteria without a bias? And then um, when we were talking last night, I said one of the things I hear from teachers all the time is they're worried that administration won't support them in these kind of conversations. And what words of advice would you have? Right. Those are both great questions. So let me start with uh, how do I make sure that I'm using the criteria without a bias? Well, to begin with, the best I think recognition we can have of ourselves is we all have biases. That's just the nature of the beast. I think the best way to make decisions both about what criteria to use to begin with and then to make decisions about which issues best adhere to those criteria is in deliberation with others. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've made a decision on my own about whether I'm gonna include a controversial political issue or not um, in my curriculum. And then I talk later with other teachers about it. And I think, wow, I wish I would have had that discussion beforehand because it might not have changed whether or not I taught that issue, but it might have changed how I taught it or what materials I used. So I would just strongly encourage you to take advantage of your colleagues and take advantage of them by developing a professional community. And those of you who teach in very small schools where you may be the only government teacher in your school, the nice thing about what Joe is doing with all these professional development sessions is you've got opportunities to meet others. And you obviously through the glories of technology have opportunities to deliberate with others. So I would try to find virtual communities if that's what you need to do in order to have those kinds of discussions. I think that's the best way to make good decisions. And then let's end with your great question, Joe, which is how do I um, deal with concerns raised by parents, um, Susan is suggesting, or by, um, by administrators about including controversial political issues. So the best thing you can do is make sure that your school administrators and parents understand why you're doing this. Because sometimes people believe that when teachers are including controversial political issues in the classroom, it's because they're standing on their own political soapbox. And what they're really trying to do is convince students to have a particular point of view on a controversial political issue. Now, in my experience, working nationally, I've encountered very few teachers who are doing that. I have encountered some teachers who are doing that, and I've always been highly critical of it. But I think for the most part, 
when teachers are including controversial political issues in the classroom and they're doing it in a high quality way, they want to make sure that students are engaged in a best case fair hearing of competing points of view and that students make up their own minds about what they believe is the best answer to the controversial political issue question. And it may be that students will say at the end, you know, I still don't have an opinion, but I have a better sense now about what I'm confused about. Um, and I heard that from a student. I just loved that. I, to me, it just typified high quality teaching. The student being able to say, you know, I'm not ready to form an opinion yet, but I now have an understanding of what what's going on with my thinking, what I'm confused about, what I need to, to work on. So I think it's really important to explain to parents and explain to administrators why you're doing this and to, uh, to do that in a way that is respectful of them and to do that in a way where they can understand that controversial political issues are not an attempt by you to uh, cause students to have a particular point of view, but that you're trying to prepare students to live um, wisely and well in a democratic community. And from my perspective um, and my experience, almost all administrators um, can, will understand that. But they tend, administrators are similar in one way. Um, and I'm now an administrator. So the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison is huge. We have a thousand faculty and staff, thousands and thousands of students. It's just a huge place. And in the last five years as the dean, the one thing that has been consistent is I don't like to be surprised. When I'm surprised by something, I tend to not make good decisions. And so I think in a similar fashion, School administrators, school board members, don't like to be surprised. They like to understand what's being taught and, and why. And there's a lot of national organizations, I would encourage you to go to the Civic Mission of the Schools website, that have prepared materials specifically for administrators, to help administrators understand why it's so important to include controversial political issues in the classroom. So that's one. Number two, the way to deal with challenges from parents and administrators is to really make sure that in your own teaching, you're doing the very best you can to teach about controversial political issues in a really high quality way. And let me end with a really short story. Um, I, I mentioned to you that I taught in a large high school outside of Chicago. And uh, one of the classes I taught, which I loved teaching, was a class called Law and American Society. And in that class, we read landmark Supreme Court decisions, uh, and we had high, I, I thought pretty, you know, really good discussions and simulations about them. And one of the decisions that we read was Roe v. Wade. And I um, had a parent um, contact me the week before we were going to be working on the Roe v. Wade case and said that she wanted to remove her student, who was a junior in high school. Um, from the class that week because she did not want her student to um, hear views about abortion that were different than the views that um, the, uh, the parents had and were in, inculcating in their kids. And I said, you know, I want to explain to you why I've included this, this court case in the curriculum, and I explained it to her using a lot of the rationales that you just heard from me. And then I said this, and it was really risky. I said, what I'd like is for you not to take your daughter out of class. I'd like you to come to class with your daughter. And um, this was a, a, a parent who had the time to do that, and I know there's all sorts of issues with that. Most parents wouldn't be able to do that. And, um, and she agreed. And I said, the only rule is you've got to do the work that the students are doing. In other words, you know, I want to make sure that all the preparation the students are doing for the number of days that we're going to be spending on this landmark Supreme Court case that you do too, because it's going to be harder for you to um, understand what we're doing if you haven't done the work. I'm not going to require her to participate. And she took me up on it. And let me tell you, I was still a pretty young teacher 
um, young both in terms of age and young in experience. Um, and I, I had the worst weekend imaginable before that week. I, all I could think about is, oh no, what's going to happen? Am I going to lose my job? Why did I do that? What was I thinking? So the, the, the a parent came in, she had done the work, she sat in the back, she didn't participate. And um, at the end, um, she came up to me and she said, I was totally wrong. I didn't understand what you were doing. I thought you were trying to convince my child to have a specific point of view about whether or not this decision in this case was a good decision or not. And that's not what you were trying to do. You were trying to do something that was quite different and something that I think was really important. And all I can tell you is that I breathe an enormous sigh of relief. And what I learned from that is, I'm not suggesting that this is something that everyone should do all the time, but what I learned is that if you can help parents understand why you're doing what you're doing, that you're much, much more likely to get support. And I want to end with this because it came up in the chat earlier when we were talking about criteria for including controversial political issues. One of the things that I've learned over decades of doing this is that what you do in class trickles up, meaning that you can have an influence on the kinds of conversations that students and young people have outside of the classroom, including conversations at the dinner table. I can't tell you how many parents have said to me, yeah, we had the most interesting conversation the other night about you know, what you had talked about in class. And you know, it just was, it was you know, really good and, and really helpful. And there is nothing better than having a parent say that because of what you are doing as a teacher, it's not only impacting my child in your class, but it's having a broader impact. And so with that, I'll end by just saying that now more than ever, teaching is a vital, a noble profession. I thank you for being teachers. Um, I thank you for working as hard as I know you do. I understand, trust me, that it is extremely difficult to be a teacher, but it is more important now than it's ever been. I think our society is going through challenges unlike anything that I've seen in my lifetime. And I know education is gonna to have to play a key role in making sure that we sustain a vibrant democracy. So thank you so much for what you do. And um, I, I know that many of you are still in, in school. The school year has not ended. When the school year does end, I know that you work hard all summer long. You know, when people say teachers don't work in the summer, it drives me crazy. But I hope you have some time this summer to re rejuvenate and um, some time to kind of get geared up for uh, next year because as we approach the 2020 elections, uh, it's going to be more important than ever to have teachers who are doing a really great job helping students um, understand and helping students form opinions on important controversial political issues. So with that, I'm going to sign off. I want to thank you, Joe, for doing this. There is not another state in the country that I'm aware of where the state social studies director has organized more than 20 professional development sessions in the last two and a half months, so stu uh, teachers have high quality opportunities to learn. Um, Joe, I, I am so impressed by what you're doing, and I hope you're sharing it with your colleagues in other states, because I think you've developed a model that really uh, is, is working and would be wonderful for other states as well. So why don't you join me, all the teachers, in um, thanking Joe. You know, the work you do really makes a difference. Thank you all. Take care. With that, I'm signing off. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Hess.